You know, man's greatest enemy is not the devil. I believe it's the sin nature. It's the, the result of the fall. It's the natural man that really has an opinion. You know that there's a war that goes on in the sight of man? It's what God says and it's what you say. It's what your circumstances says, say. It's how you feel and so forth. But really, the good news is that we are a new creation. Amen? We're a new creation. All things have passed away. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, therefore. Now, I say this. When you find a therefore in the Bible, what? You've got to see what it's there for. God is obviously wanting to say something. So he says, therefore, if anyone... Put up your hand if you're in anyone. <laughs> is in Christ. He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And in Psalm 103, I just want to read this to you. So I believe it's very, very important that we understand this. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. Anybody here ever had your life redeemed from de destruction? Come on, we're all, many of us, accidents looking for a place to happen. We're all on this highway looking for a crash. We're all going somewhere, but praise God, somehow or other, God got involved in our lives. Amen? He redeemed our life from destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. You believe that today? I believe that we serve a good God, a risen God, a God who's alive. I believe today that I have the ability to overcome the sin nature. The sin nature that wants to rule and reign by the power of the risen Christ. We, we have uh, the ability. I'm not saying that we're all doing it, but we have the ability. Right now, you have the ability to overcome. Right now, you have the ability to triumph. doesn't mean to say that you are overcoming. It doesn't mean to say that you are living in victory. But I want to tell you inside of every one of us, there is the ability to triumph over what the enemy is trying to do. And I believe that we've got to dig in and we've got to grab hold of. The Bible says you shall receive power, actually in book, the book of Acts 1.8, when God comes upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I believe that Jesus came to give you abundant life. Among many of the other promises that God's given us, we read in Psalm 103, He's come to heal and come to deliver. He's come to save our life from destruction. He's come to do all these things. But one of the things that He wants to do is give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. The enemy obviously wants to destroy that. And one, one of the things that he realizes is that when he can get on the inside of us and cause us to, to, for grief to come on there, that we start to forget who we are. One of the great problems, I believe, with mankind is that we forget who we really are. We are God's plan. God chose to create man. He never chose to create a, a broken man or a destroyed man or, or whatever, a hurting man. He, destroyed, he desired to have a man that would live in an abundance, a victorious life. The Bible says in John 10.10, 10, it says the thief does not come except to steal. He, the only reason he comes into your life is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But then Jesus came with the trump card. He said, okay, that's what the enemies come to do, but I want you to know that I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Turn around to somebody and say, I want abundant life. I want to live victorious. I want to rule and reign. I want to live above all those other, that rubbish. You must really know that God is not looking for ways to condemn you or to hurt you. That's what the enemy does. He comes in looking for ways, but God's not looking for that. God's looking for a way to, to save you, to save you from destruction, to, to heal you, to deliver you. Jesus came to redeem us. 
That's why he paid such a high price for our lives. His life for our life. Romans 8, 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Friend, we are free. Do you believe that today? God has set us free. This is not an excuse to sin. Don't be deceived by the enemy. Temptation will come, but God will send the helper. How many people need the helper today? Father, let's send the helper. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. You know, sometimes when trouble comes our way, we think we're the only person that's ever been affected like that. But it says, hey, no temptation has overtaken you except uh, such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. But with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it or endure it. He's a good God, amen? And I believe that God wants to come in a special way today and and help us. Don't let the devil or anyone tell you any different and tell you you have to put up with it or that this is be you know whatever it might be. You are free from the curse of sin and death. I am no longer a slave to sin. Amen. I've been set free. I believe that Jesus is our example. When Jesus walked on this earth, he did miracles. His words and his life caused others to believe in the power that he demonstrated. He did many great things. Jesus' life was a testament of the power of God. And I believe that God wants to raise up the church so that we become that same testament, that people will see the power, will see the victory, will see you know, that, that we are no longer slaves, that we are overcomers, that we can triumph over the works of Satan. Right now within you is the ability to triumph. Right now within you is the ability to overcome if we work with the things of God. This projector here today that's shining up there, you know, without the power, it's just, a, it's just another instrument. And there'll be no light coming from it. There'll be no display coming from it. And friend, I want to say today that we, the church, really need to plug into the power of God. We really need to plug in. We need to, we need to harness ourselves. We need to draw from it. We need to somehow or other get, get hold of God. Don't let anybody tell you that, that this is where the church is at or, or this or that. But friend, rebel against the lies of the enemy and get a hold of what God says. Amen. Amen. Jesus not only walked on water, but he controlled the weather. Jesus rebuked the wind and the sea in Mark 4, verse 39. He, he, he controlled the whole show, amen. When Peter and John touched a, a, and healed a crippled man at the gate beautiful, he just didn't walk. He just didn't walk around. No, the Bible says that he went walking and leaping and praising God, amen. There's an expression that I believe that is going to come out of the church. There's something, there's a stirring that, that, that I believe that God is doing on the inside of each and every one of us. There's a longing, there's a, there's a fresh hunger, there's a, there's, a, there's a desire in the hearts of man and woman to, to live above and not beneath. There's, a, there's something that's stirring that says you don't have to put up with this, you don't have to tolerate what the enemy's doing in this world today. There's a way that you can live above it. And that stirring on the inside is causing men and women to rise and dig in and start to seek the Lord while he may be found and catching that anointing that flows and something on the inside rises up and we start to, just like Jesus, he didn't put up with the wind and the sea. He screamed at it. He said, peace, be still. And immediately the sea was calm. Immediately the wind ceased. And there is something about that declaration. There is something about, about people rising up and, and, and being who God wants us to be. When Peter uh, and John prayed for that man, he went l- walking and leaping and praising God. How would, it, would, how would it be today if we went 
praising God everywhere we went. Amen. People think we were wacko, but it's okay. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, a lot of people think, oh, man, that really didn't happen. Friend, I want to tell you, if it's written and God said it happened, it happened. Amen. It happened. Don't let negativity get inside you. How could you feed somebody with two fish and five loaves? I want to tell you how you can do it. You can do it by the power of God because God says nothing is too difficult and nothing is too hard for God. Amen. He's a miracle working God. Amen. But not only did he feed the 5,000, but the Bible says that they were filled. And it says that they took up 12 large baskets full of doggy bags. <laughs> I'm reminded of our son. Every time we used to go out, he used to ring us up at the restaurant if we were going out with somebody in ministry. And he'd say, bring me back a doggy bag. <laughs> Jesus fed the 5,000. That's in John 6, uh, 6, 12 and 13. He is the God of more than enough. Sometimes we, we think that God is a withholder, but God is the God of more than enough. He is the God of overflow. He is the exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think God. You've got to change the way we see God. He's not looking for a way to hurt you. He's not looking for a way to condemn you. He's looking for a, a way to rise you up. Amen. He's looking for a way to, to, to take you to a, a new level. Amen. Paul knew uh, and understood what Jesus could do. You, you've, somehow or other, we've got to change the way we think. In 2 Timothy 1.12, it says, I know whom I have believed. Do you know who you believed? Or, or have you got man's interpretation of, of, the, of Jesus? Have you got just man's interpretation? Or have you got, because you've failed a few times or because you've had problems, are you allowing that to dominate and control your interpretation of who God is? We've got to understand if we want to hit the mark, we've got to change the way we think. And Paul, I praise God, he, he spoke out. He knew who he believed in. He said, I know whom I, be I have believed and am persuaded. Are you persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day? In other words, you're saying, I believe Jesus will after me. look after me. I believe that Jesus has got my back. Um, it wasn't just that he was proud. It wasn't that he was saying, oh, hallelujah, I'm better than somebody else. No, it just means that he was persuaded that what God said he could do, he could do, hallelujah. And he knew that his God could look after him no matter what storm he went through, no matter where he went. As a matter of fact, one time he was in a shipwreck. There was a, a shipwreck thing going on and he just spoke the word of God. And he said, listen, he said, if you stay in the ship, you'll live. But if you get out, you'll die. In the middle of that, he was persuaded that God could look after him. And when he got onto dry land, a serpent grabbed hold of his hand and bit him. And the people thought that God's judgment had come upon him. But instead of that, he was persuaded that no matter what, God was going to look after him because God had said that he was going to go to Rome and he knew that hell or high water, nothing could stop. What he, no serpent, no snake, no situation was going to stop it. No storm. He was persuaded that what God God said he was able to perform. And he just shook the thing off. Friend, I want to tell you, there's some things we've got to shake off. You might think, but man, you've got no idea. I'll tell you what, friend, I've been around for a few years. I have an idea. I'm not some whippersnipper. I've been through life a bit, amen? I know a few things, but I also know what my God can do. Now, friend, he knew that no situation, no person, no devil could overpower Almighty God. What a, what a confidence that is. It's not being proud. It's not, it's not doing it. No, it's just being persuaded. Just knowing that God could do it. I believe that God could do it. Are you persuaded Jesus will look after you? Are you persuaded that Jesus has got your back? I believe that Paul had an amazing confidence. I want you to have a look with look at me, look with me in the book of Romans. Romans chapter eight.
appreciate what Sharon spoke this morning about making a declaration. Because usually we make the wrong declaration. Many times we, we say the wrong thing. But Paul knew that no situation, no person, no devil could over overpower Almighty God. If you can somehow or other put your hand, your life into God's hands, he will look after you. The devil may have attacked him, but Paul's confession and attitude towards the problem were demonstrated, I believe, in these words. Verse 31 of Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God wants to freely give you all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or divorce or some other thing? As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm talking about a man here who is fully persuaded that God is able to look after him. It says here for, in verse 38, For I am persuaded. Friend, what are you persuaded about today? I am so persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You see, man has been deceived. We've, we've, we've sort of, whether it be when you're a kid or where, whether it be at the pub or whether it be at the footy game or whatever it might be, where we get amongst a bunch of people and they might have seen somebody that's a Christian and, and they say bad things, pull them down, weak. My dad, I remember, as a, as a, young, as a young man, my dad had, a, had an attitude towards Christianity. He looked at Christians and he, and he despised them and, and he said, these, these weak people need a, need a crutch. But yet my dad was addicted to alcohol. He was addicted to cigarette. A cigarette, which is about two and a half inches long, controlled him. And he called a man that could give his life to Christ weak. But I want to tell you one day when he's about 86 years of age, he stood at an altar and he heard a man preach. And he somehow or other, I watched his hand go up as he accepted Jesus Christ. He walked out the front one day because he realized that after all these years, all these years, he had been fed a lie. He had been fed a lie because somehow or other, some, somebody, whoever it might have been, demonstrated that God could help us, that God could see you through the, the trials of life. Friend, I would like to say that, that you know, life was just like tiptoeing through the tulips with Tiny Tim, but it's not. Life can be a, a tremendous struggle and hurts and disappointments can come your way and brokenness and strife. Things that, that we don't deserve attack us. I remember at the age of about seven or eight years of age, I had a man try to molest me. Did I deserve that? No, I didn't. But I was at the wrong place at the wrong time and that had a tremendous effect on my life. Bitterness and hatred and anger got inside of me. And I lived that way for I don't know how many years. I got married. Unfortunately, I brought all that rubbish in with me. Almost destroyed my life. Just almost destroyed my marriage. But I thank God. I thank God today. And I am persuaded that nothing, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God. If we're prepared to open up our lives 
if we're prepared to get rid of the, 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 the pride or the arrogance or whatever it might be, the lies and the deceit that gets inside of us that, that somehow or other we think that there's a one law for them and another law for me. I'm to tell you, God is an amazing God. I am persuaded, he said. He knew that nothing could separate him. These verses are all, are all full of, of our victory. Any verse would send the devil for a valium. <laughs> oh my God, if only the church could rise up. I spoke last week, if only, if only, if only God had free access to flow through us to church instead of being clogged up with all the rubbish and the junk. But I believe that God's about to send the fire. He's going to burn all that rubbish up. Amen. And we're going to rise up. We're going to be the church. We're going to see the power of God manifested. Knowing God has got your back and nothing can separate you from the love of God. You know what amazes me is while we're yet sinners, God loved us, that he sent his son. God's left us his word. You can't live a successful Christian life without the word of God. Romans 1.16 says this. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Put up your hand today if you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Come on, declare it today. Wave your hands. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's a lot easier to assemble a flat pack if you read and follow the instructions. <laughs> How many men here? <laughs> it's the last thing you look at. When that which meant was supposed to be a wardrobe looks more like a table. <laughs> We need the Word of God. You might notice that I've got a few funny blotches on my face. I uh, have what they call shingles in the head. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, you have shingles, but he said, it's not contagious. It's not contagious. I said, oh, that's good. Because the particular, this but. There's di different kinds apparently, but this kind I got is a special one. <laughs> Not contagious. But somehow or other, the doctor told me it's not contagious. But somehow or other, in my wife's little brain, <laughs> this thing is very contagious. <laughs> my good friend Joe, my good friend Joe. I rang him up and he said, how are you doing, Neil? I said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, thank you. I said, but I've, I've got shingles. He said, don't come near me. <laughs> My good friend Joe. Even this morning. <laughs> it's still in there. I said, and every time Nancy says, it's contagious, I say, the doctor said, <laughs> it is not contagious. This morning, again, I don't know what, that's at the stage, how many, this very contagious, I said, the doctor, she said, I know what the doctor said. But you see, it's in her brain. Because somewhere, somebody told her, That it's chicken pox. <laughs> it's related to chicken pox. But I don't know, a distant relative. <laughs> but not a contagious relative. 
Friend, it's not what is in our brain. It's not what we've been told. I, my dad told me that Christians that need a crutch. No, we don't need a crutch, hallelujah. We need a saviour, hallelujah, that can deliver me and set me free from the power of sin. Can help me get rid of cigarettes, glory to God, and anything else that you need to get rid of. Because that's what God does, amen. He's a good God. But it is a lot easier. How many people know it's a lot easier when you read the instructions? And you've got to do what the doctor says, amen. I, he told me it's not contagious. I believe it. Amen. If you catch it, it's not my fault. <laughs> Richard came, the electrician, and he says, I was talking to him on the phone. He said, I'm, I'm not well, Neil. I've got, I've got the shingles. Two days later, he came to my house. I said, I've got the shingles through the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Has he still got the shingles? <laughs> oh, praise God. How many people love Jesus? We need the instructions. <laughs> How you going, man? <laughs> see, see when, when, when you got saved, and you know, we water baptized some people the other day, and, and I said to him, I said, listen, you've got to understand this. You're not going in the water dry, coming out wet. That's not what you, something supernatural is going to happen to you. The old man's going to die, and you're going to take on a whole new form. And and, and you know you can live above, you can live victorious because you're identifying with Jesus, what He said. And we've got to be able to identify with what God's saying. See, when I got saved, the Bible tells me that the King of Glory came into my life. So I just, didn't, I just didn't come out the front and, and somebody said a little prayer over me and I walked away. When, when Peter uh, and John prayed for that man, he just didn't get up and just start walking away. I prayed. No, he went walking and leaping and praising God. Hallelujah. You know, he was excited about what God was doing. And when I got saved, I just didn't get, you know, a, somebody throw me a, a, a rubber, you know, one of those little rubber ducky rings and, and left me floating around in a pool of sharks. He delivered me out of. He took me out of it, amen. And, and he said, and he came into my life. Psalm 24, amazing psalm here. And it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Come on, the King of glory wants to come into your life. Where am I? Who is this King of glory that wants to come into my life? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your, your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen. The King of glory. Col Colossians 1 verse 27, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amazing. Christ in me. The power of Christ in you will do what the presence of Christ did when he walked on this earth. See, just let me say that again. God in you will do exactly what the presence of in you, it will do exactly in you what the presence of God did when he walked on this planet. The Bible says that he went around doing good, healing all who are oppressed to the devil because God was with him. He wants to set us free. He wants to totally set us free. The power of Christ in you will do what the presence of Christ did when he walked on this earth. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you now. Not later on, it's in you now. When you know God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He cares for you. He cares what, what's in front of you. He cares What's going on? He loves you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll walk you through it. No matter what's going on, he'll walk you through it. He'll walk you through it. 
There's some people obviously in this world today that need somebody to help them walk through some stuff. And I don't know about you, but all I know is it's got to be God. It's not just going to church. I walked into the chook house the other day and I didn't become a rooster. It's not just going to church. Some people say, oh, I'll go to church. That's it. No, no, no. It'll certainly help. But it's receiving. It's proclaiming. It's knowing. It's being persuaded. Can I say this? I don't care who you are. There's not one of us in this room that deserves the love of God. I cannot say that there's one thing I did on this earth that caused me to deserve God's love. But you know what? Somewhere God said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friend, I want to recommend Jesus Christ. But I also want to recommend that we, we sort of get out of some of the circumstances and situations we're in and start to not cop it, but start to declare and break through, amen, and live above and not beneath. Just bow your heads with me. Father, we're in this house right now. We're your people. You're our God. And my God, right now I pray that only the Holy Spirit can take even what I've spoken today and attriculate it and bring it into the heart of man to help them, my God, to see the way of escape, the victory, to be able to receive the abundant life. And Lord, I know, I know, I know, I know for many, many years I lived so far below that I never had that assurance. But my God, I now, I know who I believe in and I am persuaded that nothing can separate me from your love. No matter what happens, my God, you will walk me through the minefield of life. And Father, I pray today that there are people here that can reach out to you if you're in this house right now and you don't have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have that meaningful relationship, you're not sure even where you're at, but you want to make sure. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, would you just quickly slip up your hand and say, that's me today. I want to meet with this one. Just slip it up. Slip it up. I don't know everybody in this building. Slip it up right now. Let's stand to our feet. Chris was saying, you know, that he just sensed this morning that people were being touched during the worship and during the praise. And Sometimes we need to act on what, what God's doing in our lives just to, to establish it, to establish it in us. Otherwise, it was just a little flip and it's gone. But in this presence, you know, there may be things that you need to just establish. I may have reaffirmed some things while I've been preaching this morning. But if you're here today and God is speaking to you and you need to just make that stand while we sing this song. I don't know what we're singing. Whatever it is, we're going to sing I'm No Longer a Slave. And you might feel today that you're a slave to something. Jesus paid the price for you today. He paid the ransom. It's come.